and a reinvestment and a recommitment of invigoration and energy into the story of what is Boston University and what does the School of the Prophets have to say. I wanted to recognize a couple of our important personages who are with us in the school all the time, but I want you to know them as family, friends, and guests. Among them, I'd like to recognize our Director of Admissions, Anastasia Kidd. Without her, we don't have profits for the future. <laughs> and if you would, stand up. <laughs> Among the distinctions for the School of Theology over this next couple of years is that we boast now to have the Vice Chair of the Faculty for this year and the Chair of the Faculty for the entire University next year Dr. Kathy Dar. And that, for us, this is a thrilling moment because it only took 172 years to get somebody to be chair of the faculty. <laughs> so this is, this is big. This is big. And we, ex we expect great, mighty, and wondrous things uh, during Kathy's term. I also want to recognize sort of, and this is wonderful, we have two deans in the room today. Uh, and the first I want to recognize is Dean Ray Hart, who I was privileged to meet several years ago. And he said, if you believe in the school, then you better come back and work for it. Little did I know that he would pass that message on to Dean Moore and that I would end up working for it. Uh, so uh, I'm delighted to have come home. Ray, thank you. Why Ray is important it was Ray and our next and our speaker, to, the first speaker on this list today, Steve Morin, who made that journey in, of discovery into the story of the Collins chair and what had happened to that story and why. And it was Ray who ventured out to Portland, Oregon and told the story to the Collins family and the Collins Foundation. And Miss Mary Beth Collins, the grand matron really embrace that story, embrace Ray, and see, he's a Texan, I'm a Texan, so if you can't love us, then you just pay us to go. <laughs> and, and, and Ray told the story, and this whole adventure was born and reborn. And so Ray, on behalf of all of us today, thank you for your vision, thank you for your energy, and thank you for your foresight. Yes. Yes. We're here because you did that. We also have the Dean of the School of Theology who, who kicks butt and takes names. <laughs> she looks quiet, pleasant, and easy enough, but trust me, we love to work at the BU School of Theology. <laughs> or else. And if you don't believe me, ask how many self-studies we're having, just this year alone. But I want to recognize our leader, our team, Mary Elizabeth. Yay. One of the joys of being a director of development is that you get to find out just how much work there is to be done and how many hours you have to do a week's work in. And uh, Dean Moore really inspires and challenges all of us because her efforts are unceasing, her energy is inexhaustible, and the energy that you might have caught a hold of in the chapel today and that you're seeing and hearing from this school of theology is in large part due to her inexhaustible supply of energy and leadership. And we are so grateful for it. We have a program today. It's brief and to the point, but every person involved is important. And they will simply come up one at a time without introduction, so I'll tell you who they all are. Steve Morin was the Director of Development at the School of Theology when the Collins concept was born. Today, he's an Assistant Vice President of Development for this Boston University. In case no one's told you, we are in a $1 billion quiet campaign. That's why you've not heard about it. Uh, and I'm pleased to report a quarter of a billion has already been raised on that campaign, and more is coming every day. This university is on the go. We have extraordinary leadership, and people like Steve have been among those leaders. 
And what he had done for the School of Theology, he is now doing for a variety of our schools. There are 17 of them at Boston University, and Steve is deeply involved with the schools and colleges in helping them learn how to do this right. But he cut his teeth at the School of Theology, <laughs> never forget. So Steve will speak on behalf of the administration. In another room in this same building, the Board of Trustees of the University is meeting as we speak today. And they are talking about the next phase of the campaign for Boston University. The School of Theology's share of that billion dollars is $25 million, and I hope you'll all write your checks before you leave. <laughs> I counted 25, so we could be done by the end of the afternoon. Not a problem. Uh, but we are glad Steve is here today. Steve will then be followed by Jerry Anderson. Jerry Anderson is a pioneer in missionary work, and he led the committee uh, of the School of Theology and friends and neighbors and loved ones around the country in bringing together the funding needed to support this program and make it the success that it is today. And then as a response to this, we will then hear from Terry Collins representing the Collins family and Collins Foundation. Now Terry won't say a lot of things about all the things the Collins do, but missionaries around the world know the Collins family by name and by heart. The family endowed many years ago the pensions of United Methodist ministers around the world as missionaries of the church, and that family has sustained and fortified that giving throughout the ages. It is thrilling to know that a story that began in Pennsylvania, and one of the lovely things I learned today is Barbara Collins is from Pennsylvania. So they went from Pennsylvania to Oregon back to Pennsylvania. And Barbara and Terry are here with us from Northern California. Uh, it is an astonishing family. It's a great story, and it's a vision of 100 years of mission that this family has led and really given a very gentle and quiet witness across the nation and around the world. The name Collins is imprinted in the hearts of many missionaries, particularly in the years after they retire, as that work has supported them. And then finally, the real reason why we're here is finally Dana Robert gets to have her own chair. Yay! Decades, Dana has been holding forth, raising up the next generation of missionaries and explaining the history. God love her, she hadn't had a chair to sit in until today. <laughs> so we are delighted that the triumph, the symbol today of this experience of what we are about, is really the symbol of this chair. Now somebody said, is it really that important to have a chair? Until you have one, you have no right to answer the question. <laughs> so we have a chair, and it's the second chair in the history of Boston University School of Theology. But it was among the first to formally be funded 100 years ago, and today we bring that story to completion. So I thank you for being here. Uh, I will close this and dismiss this at the end. But first, recognize Steve, and then each of you just follow as the order of the program. It's great to be back. Um, some people joke that universities uh, work at a fairly slow pace. But taking 100 years to finish the chair might have set a record. <laughs> but we are delighted. It, it's, it's just wonderful to be able to be here and celebrate the Collins family, to celebrate Dana, uh, and to celebrate this effort. There's obviously a lot of people um, that played a great role in this. Um, you know, thanks to Terry and Barbara for being here, uh, and the whole Collins family, and the history. Thanks to Ray for the gumption to pick up the phone and call Mary Beth. Uh, thanks to, uh, to everyone who's here now, uh, to Jacqueline, to Ted, uh, to Mary Elizabeth. Uh, for continuing the tradition, just bringing forth, I mean, you know, when I was first thinking about this, I said, oh, Jesus, it's remarkable. Um, when you look at this document, uh, which, is, which is fantastic, to think about what was going on at the time, the impact that the School of Theology had on the world, and what we're doing now, but then I saw, you know what, it's not remarkable. It's not remarkable at all. It's actually what the School of Theology does. And it's been doing forever and ever. It's the founding school of BU, and it continues to be the leader 
uh, around Boston University. So everything, you know, we just continue, we continue on impacting the world as we did in 1912 as we're doing today. Uh, and everyone in this room should be thanked for that. Uh, thanks to Jerry as well uh, for this effort. And everyone who contributed to this should be very proud uh, of continuing on this tradition. Um, we are in a great spot now. I get the vantage point of seeing various schools and colleges and their works around Boston University. And I can easily say that the School of Theology, <coughs> under the direction of Mary Elizabeth Moore, is, is easily the best school to be right now. Yes. So, the work you're doing and the leadership you're showing in the areas and the arenas that matter to us as human beings in this world right now, it starts right here. It starts right here. So you all should be proud. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jerry. In the tradition that I come from in a small Methodist Church in Western Pennsylvania, we still believe in giving testimonies. So I want to give a testimony. As I thought about this occasion, it suddenly occurred to me that my entire professional career as a Methodist minister and missionary has been linked in one way or another to the Collins family and to Mr. Truman Collins. It began in 1954 when I was a senior student here at the School of Theology. I had a required course in world mission that was taught by Dr. Fred Field Goodsell, who had recently retired as the former executive vice president of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. Retired, taught part-time at the School of Theology for a few years. I suspect he was part-time because at that point, due to the Depression, uh, there was not enough money in the endowment uh, for a full-time person. And uh, so that was the best they could afford. But I tell you, Dr. Goodsell was a saintly man who had a wealth of experience as the former head of the oldest mission board in America. One morning, Dr. Goodsell came into the class and said, this morning, I want you to imagine that you're riding on a train in South India. And sitting across from you in the compartment is a Hindu gentleman who learns that you are a missionary. And he says to you, tell me what Christ means to you and why you think I should become a Christian. Now, said Dr. Goodsell, I want each of you to come up here in the front of the class and take three minutes to answer those questions. And we'll go in alphabetical order. Anderson, you go first. <laughs> you come up and give your three-minute answer to that Hindu gentleman. Well, I tell you, I don't remember anything I said. I only remember that my knees were knocking and that I wished my name was Zabriskie. <laughs> but I still remember the questions. And I have spent the last 55 years dealing with those questions, starting with my doctoral dissertation here on the theology of mission. And when I finished my dissertation, I figured I had to really try it out. So my wife and I went as Methodist missionaries to teach at Union Theological Seminary in the Philippines for a decade. And as Ted has already suggested, in retirement now, I receive part of my pension from the Collins Pension Fund for Retired Methodist Missionaries of the General Board of Global Ministries. So my career began when I was inspired by the Collins part-time professor of missions here at the School of Theology, <coughs> which resulted in my missionary career. And now in retirement, I am supported partly by the Collins Pension Fund for Retired Methodist Missionaries. I and thousands of other graduates from the school over the last 100 years 
owe a huge debt of gratitude to Truman Collins, his family, and descendants. And the School of Theology owes a huge debt of gratitude to Truman Collins and his family for making this possible, this occasion, and for continuing the support of this vital position on the faculty which we celebrate today. And of course, we not only celebrate the chair, but we are proud to have one of the most widely honored missiologists in the world sitting in that chair, teaching in that chair, as the Truman Collins Professor of World Mission at Boston University School of Theology, Dr. Dana Roberts. Uh -huh. saying that uh, it's really great to be here and to be a part of this, um, of this celebration. Um, my great-grandfather, T.D. Collins, was, uh, was kind of one of those ancestors who I always kind of thought I would have liked to have known. Uh, and to give just a very brief background, um, he, he grew up on a farm in Portland, New York, and apparently by the age of 14, he had uh, built up a commission on dairy products from the surrounding farms for the New York City market. So he kind of showed those entrepreneurial skills at a pretty early age. He went to Cortland Academy for a brief spell, and then he hired on to a survey crew that were building the railroad from Binghamton to Syracuse, New York. He uh, apparently worked his way into a, a position where it appears as though he might have had a pretty promising career with the railroad. So it's kind of a mystery as to why one day he headed out with his brother and three other um, young men, and they headed for the wilds of western Pennsylvania. They arrived in Hickory Town, which is one of the, the earliest settlements along the Allegheny River in the fall of 1854, and they worked in a logging camp that winter. And the following spring, they took out a loan, and they uh, bought a little steam sawmill and about 1,400 acres of timberland. Uh, so this was to be the start of a long career in timbering and lumbering that would span almost 60 years and, um, and, and in which um, in the latter part of the 1800s his operations would, would grow very rapidly as the steam locomotives came into the picture and, and the larger band saw mills that were able to finance the construction of railroads into every part of the forest. So he was very much a part of what is sometimes referred to as the logging railroad era in western Pennsylvania. Um, a, a pretty uh, significant event occurred in the early 1860s when um, a Methodist preacher by the name of Reverend Hicks uh, went to the backwoods of Pennsylvania to preach the gospel and apparently had a revival meeting in Beaver Valley, Pennsylvania. Uh, the story has it that a, um, a sturdy looking man with piercing eyes came forward and pledged his life to Christ. I don't think the Reverend Hicks could have probably um, appreciated the significance of that event at the time in terms of dollars that would flow to Methodist missions in the years after that. But I always kind of had sort of a suspicion that his conversion might have had something to do with a uh, his acquaintance at that time to a red-haired school teacher, <laughs> Mary Stanton, who would soon become his wife. Mary Stanton came from a, a religious background, and actually her ancestry, like his, went back to some of the early Puritans who came to this region pretty much in the wake of the Mayflower. So when I, when I think about this crusty entrepreneur who was reputed to have never worn a white-collared shirt in his life, it's, it's been interesting to me to learn about some of the things that he um, supported during the course of his life, oftentimes things relating to universities and academies and of course global ministries, um, things that would tend to kind of give the impression of a more cosmopolitan person than, than he appeared to have been. But um, a few years ago, a number of members of my family came back to Pennsylvania to, to celebrate our 150, um, 50th anniversary in the lumber business. And I, so I think we all feel kind of blessed to be a part of a legacy that he started back in the mid-1800s. And um, so it's, it's really been nice to have been part of this um, effort to 
put something back into something that, that he started here at Boston University 100 years ago. So I just wanted to express my appreciation to many people in this room for, for all of the efforts in partnering with us to bring this endowment up to a level where we can, it can continue to support scholarship in this important field for, for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. here and also my son John here and my husband Enos. So thank you all. I'd like to talk today about the School of Theology and the history of missions in the School of Theology. First I'll talk about the beginnings. In the 1800s the rapid growth of the United States created a shortage of well-trained clergy. Nowhere was this problem as acute as among Methodists who by mid-century comprised one in three Christians in the United States. And so a missionary, you now I have to get this, okay, there we go. A missionary to South America named John Dempster partnered with a Bible teacher and future bishop, Osmond Baker, to found the Methodist General Biblical Institute, the first Methodist theological school in North America. The theology emphasized the power of self-improvement through education, self-discipline, and social holiness. And this public theology undergirded the growing middle classes of the mid to late, mid to late 1800s. It also assumed that Christian values mattered in shaping society. Thus, through the efforts of devout Methodist businessmen, Lee Claflin, founder of a shoe factory, a clothing merchant, Jacob Sleeper, and a fishmonger, Isaac Rich, Boston University was chartered in 1869. The governor who signed the university charter was William Claflin, son of one of the founders and the first Methodist governor of the state of Massachusetts. So the Biblical Institute was reborn as the Boston University School of Theology, the founding school of Boston University. From the beginning, missions embodied the global hopes and dreams of the clergy and laity who founded the School of Theology. Graduates from the late 1850s included some of the first Methodist missionaries to India, China, and Bulgaria, not to mention itinerant pastors who served poor communities throughout New England. Now, the missionary focus was reinforced when the organizers called the Reverend William F. Warren from his post as a missionary in Germany to lead the theology school and then the new university. And he brought with him a profound interest in missions, comparative religions, and cultures, and he instituted the first teaching in this field in the United States. On February 26, 1869, Jacob Sleeper recorded in the minutes of the seminary prudential committee that it voted to establish a Department of Missionary Instruction. And then the object of the department is stated right here. So from the beginnings of the theology school, the curriculum was shaped by these global interests. Multiple languages were taught. Students in the 1870s could study Arabic, Aramaic, Syriac, German, Spanish, Italian, French, Hindustani, Latin and Chinese in the theology school, plus the biblical languages. And retired, there was a whole string of retired missionaries who came and taught courses in the religions and cultures of India and China and the various parts of the world from which they had come. On a practical side, those in this mission curriculum 
did three years of urban mission outreach among immigrants with the Boston Methodist City Missionary Society, and they attended medical lectures free of charge. <laughs> Another strong driver of missionary piety in the theology school was the founding of the Women's Foreign Missionary Society of the Methodist Episcopal Church, also in 1869. Now these are just a few of the founders, but the majority of founders and all of, and the early officers all had profound linkages to Boston University School of Theology. That's a whole other story at which I could talk at great length, but one of them, even Mrs. Parker of the right, even had attended the Concord Biblical Institute. Another of the founders was a preceptress in the Vermont School so that preceded Concord. So it's embedded all the way through. The Constitution for the Women's Foreign Missionary Society was written up in the living room of the Warrens. And Mrs. Warren became the editor of Heathen Woman's Friend, the preeminent mission journal of the women's missionary movement. Mrs. Osmond Baker was the first national president of the Women's Foreign Missionary Society. Another piece of mission history connected to BU that must be mentioned is the founding of the Deaconess Training School in 1889. Again, many connections, Isabella Thoburn, whose brother was ordained with William Warren, all of this network. Isabella Thoburn came back from India and founded this deaconess school. The deaconesses went into the inner city as nurses and social workers and abroad as foreign missionaries. They founded the deaconess hospital. They founded what became the School of Religious Education that later merged into STH and split into the School of Social Work. So the deaconess school is actually the root for many of the missionaries who later graduated from the School of Religious Education and is the mother of the joint degree between STH and the School of Social Work. Another piece of the missionary vision was international students. The first graduating class in 1869 included Antonio Arriqui, who was a former drummer boy in Garibaldi's Army of Independence and then an escaped galley slave. He came to the U.S., converted to Christ, and after his graduation from the theology school, returned to Italy to found the Methodist Church in Italy. So what you have by the late 1880s, 1800s is the global history of expanding networks. The local context of immigrant Boston fed the global work. The local fed the global, the global fed the local. Seminary graduates, recent immigrants, international students, returned missionaries, professors, deaconesses, they all milled around together in this milieu. It was a circulating movement that founded schools, started churches, and worked for social change around the world. Now let us imagine one century ago. Missionary education received a huge boost in 1910 with the World Missionary Conference at Edinburgh. Protestant mission leaders from around the world, including numerous STH alums, gathered to consider important issues in world evangelization, missions in government, and mission education. And this conference created energy for mission education in theological seminaries. So meanwhile, at the School of Theology, an active band of student volunteer movement, and this is a photo taken by one of our students as he attended the great SBM convention, this created energy around students pledging themselves to become foreign missionaries. And in January of 1912, Bishop McDowell dedicated this missionary map prepared by one of the student members of the student volunteer band, showing the location of the first hundred missionaries sent by the theology school. At that time, 40 members of the student body were preparing themselves to become missionaries. Now, the STH catalog for 1913 can carry the following special announcement, quote, it is gratifying to announce that a friend has expressed his purpose to endow a department of missions. An increasingly large proportion of our student body are volunteers for foreign service <coughs> and so on. So it talked about Mr. T.D. Collins endowing all of this various teaching and missions, including things like soci sociology and evangelism and all of the adjacent fields. The catalog of 1915 contained the heading Department of Missions, missions founded by Mr. T.D. Collins in 1912. So with his donation of $100,000, 
Collins put the study of missions on a firm foundation through the 1920s. The biography of T.D. Collins was remarkably similar to that of the lay founders of Boston University, Claflin, Sleeper, and Rich. As we've already heard, Collins was a self-made converted lumberman who led a pious and disciplined life, and he gave to Methodist educational enterprises around the country. Now let me turn, return to the idea of networking. The late 19th and early 20th century saw an explosion in interconnectivity similar to how our generation has experienced the internet. Steamship, telegraph, railroad, railroad and wireless, i.e. radio, combined with the Pax Britannica, revolutionized communication and transportation. The missionary movement represented the church engaging these global realities. Thus you got Christian businessmen like T.D. Collins, who himself harnessed various forms of transportation for his own enterprise, drawn to missions as a kind of a spiritual parallel. So you've got, the, in a sense, the idealistic side of this whole interconnectivity was part of what fueled so much interest in missions a hundred years ago. Thus, by the early 20th century, STH graduates were participating in global networks that fed back into the life of the school. Now, this map only shows so-called foreign locations, so it does not visibly reflect the home mission territory of the school, but it was impossible to separate the two. Now, what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is talk about two of the met networks that show these local global connections in the history of our school. The founders of Boston University believed in human e equality. They opposed slavery. Their sons all fought in the Civil War. So after the war, educating freed slaves was one of the biggest challenges for home missions. The same year that Governor Claflin chartered BU, his family founded Claflin University to educate freedmen in South Carolina. Thus, the founding of Methodist schools throughout the South fed into BU because people could not go for higher degrees in those southern schools. The African American Mission Network began with John Wesley Edward Bowen, who was the first PhD graduate in the School of Theology. Born into slavery, Bowen attended what is now Dillard University in New Orleans, and he came here for his theology degree and his PhD. And I know many of you are familiar with his distinguished career, so I won't go into, a, into that, but you might not know how passionately interested in missions he was. In 1895, he organized a three-day Congress on Africa that explored the relationship between African Americans and Africa especially missions and social change. His wife, Ariel, also pictured here, was a life member of the Methodist Home Missionary Society and a professor of music at Clark University in Atlanta, another school founded by Methodists in 1869, same year, to educate African Americans. Now, the Clark connection is another important piece of our mission history because from it came from what I believe were the first two African-American women who were theology students. One of them, Anna Hall, whose picture I haven't been able to find, attended the Deaconess Training School and was the first African-American fully trained deaconess in the United States. She spent 24 years in Liberia. Then this one pictured here, Martha Drummer, both, both those women went to Clark, you see, and then they came here to, to the Deaconess School to do their higher education. Martha Drummer entered the Deaconess School in 1901. Then, after doing the program, she did three years of nurses' training and was appointed by the Women's Foreign Missionary Society. And as the first African-American deaconess, nurse deaconess, Martha Drummer went to Angola in 1906 and remained there about 20 years, and she was the only medical person in the area, plus ran this girl's school that you see here. This mission still exists. Mm. Now, there's a lot more I could say about this. You can go into our 20th century history. It's James Farmer Sr., uh, Ralph Dodge, Doug Moore, Martin Luther King Jr.'s teacher, Harold DeWolf, and on and on and on. The local and the global fed each other throughout the 20th century with the history of African Americans in the School of Theology. But a second network I want to talk about is the China network. 
The Methodist Biblical Institute class of 1858 included Stephen Baldwin and in 1859 Carlos Martin, two of the first Protestant missionaries to China. And Baldwin remained in China over 20 years. Another great BU missionary, though, was John Ferguson, who graduated from the, the undergrad program in 1886. He founded two universities in China, Nanjing University and then Shanghai Jiaodong University, one of the best technical universities in the country. He then came back to BU for another degree and was the leading expert in Chinese art in the late 18 and early 1900s, and his collection is the core of the Met's, um, the Metropolitan Museum in New York's China collection. Another one, of course, famous Bishop James Bashford, class of night, who in 1904 became the first resident Methodist bishop in China, one of the great leaders of the ecumenical movement at the turn of the 20th century. Now, the missionary path was a two-way street. The first Chinese president of Nanjing Theological Seminary, Reverend Handel Li, got STH degrees in 1922 and 33. And in 1927, the Dean of the Faculty of Theology at Peking University, Timothy Ping-Fang Lu, was appointed visiting professor of missions and religions at the School of Theology. Lu was the first non-Western professor of missions who ever taught in the United States, and he also was the teacher of our late Dean Walter Mueller. <laughs> Lu was the first great liturgist of Chinese Protestantism, and he produced a series of experimental Chinese liturgies on marriage, burial, holy communion, and so forth. Now, he collaborated in his hymnal work with the STH graduate Bliss Wyant, who was called as a boy to go to China to foster indigenous Chinese hymnody. So Wyant studied here in the 1920s and was ordained as a full-time music missionary. Went to China and he collaborated with Lu and they produced the first indigenous Chinese hymnals that was the, the, the hymnal for all of um, Chinese Protestantism in the 1920s. So here's, you know, just some of his books. This was called Hymns of Universal Praise. Now, with the expulsion of Western missionaries from China in 1951, the School of Theology China Missionary Network came to a close. But as churches reopened in the 1980s, a new phase of China outreach emerged. Some of our, and we now have, these are all um, Chinese graduate students that I've worked with that came, and all of them are head of major institutions or senior church pastors. These all have THGs from the theology school with distinguished positions um, here and back in, in uh, East Asia. But no, most notable for missions, I'll focus just on this one, Kevin Xi Yi Yao, a first generation Christian who became the first mainlander to teach at the Chinese Graduate School of Theology in Hong Kong and was the head of their mission outreach to mainland China. Xi Yi has just been appointed professor of missions at the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and begins in January. Now because of lack of time, rather than continue a narrative history, uh, I'm going to present for the rest of my brief time a brief roll call of some of the STH missionaries, including students who had profound missionary commitments. And the frustration here is who to leave out. You know, this it always takes you forever when you're a historian to write something because figuring out what to leave out is harder than figuring out what to include. <laughs> but I'm delighted that we're going to have an, we're have an STH history project that's been moving along slowly that eventually we want, to, we want to have a website where information about all of these incredible alums can be on the website. The lives of our students demonstrate the depth and breadth of the BU tradition of global mission and outreach and also show the integral connection between local and global. So I'll just mention a few fairly quickly. William Olden, Bishop of the Methodist Episcopal Church and considered founder of, mission, of Methodism in Singapore and Malaysia. Was a delegate to the Edinburgh 1910 Conference, five-time delegate to General Conference. Edgar Helms, 1895 founder of Morgan Memorial Goodwill Industries, taught home missions at STH for many years. His wife taught at the Deaconess School. In 1907, Helms founded the Morgan Memorial School of Applied Christianity that taught courses on for youth and adult education. 
Now, 10 years later, that freelance school merged into the Deaconess Training School that they merged into BU in 1917 to become the School of Religious Education. Peter Dunoff, uh, also known as Bainsa Duma, was one of the, the number of Bulgarian students who came here in the late 1800s. And that's a story in itself, how the translation of the Bible into Bulgarian created an independence movement of freeing the Bulgarians from Turkish control. Mm -hmm. So he's one of the ones sent, and he, start, and he became an ascended master of the Universal White Brotherhood, a famous Bulgarian mystic nationalist who revived indigenous uh, kind of dancing steps uh, that were, were practiced by Bulgarian nationalists. And he was attacked by the communists when communism came in. One of our more interesting mission type graduates, <laughs> <laughs> Frederick Von Fisher, missionary to India, head of the layman's missionary movement, chairman of the Steel Strike Investigation Committee of 1919 and the first, um, the resident bishop, bishop in Calcutta. Helen Kim, first Korean president of the largest women's university in the world. She earned her master's degree in the School of Religious Education here in 1925. She was world president of the YMCA. Josiah Kabira, first black African bishop of the Northwest Diocese of the, of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and he made the crucial transition from colonialism. In 1977, he was elected the first and only African to be the head of the Lutheran World Federation. And the headquarters of the Al African Conference of Churches are named after Kabira. His terminal degree here was from BU in 1964, one of our most important graduates that we don't know about. Here we have two STH missionary peacemakers. Dr. Phil Bosserman, professor of sociology and peace studies and founder of, founder of the Center for Conflict Resolution in Salisbury University, at Salisbury University in Maryland, worked in Equatorial Africa as director of educational programs for the Peace Corps, a long history of training people for the Peace Corps. And of course, oops, got to go back to Richard Dietz. Um, let's see, okay, Richard Dietz, whom, whom many of you know, uh, ahead of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and missionary to the Philippines. Orthodox mission leaders came here. The one on the right, Alexander Veronis, is the founder of the Orthodox Mission Institute and a frequent Orthodox delegate to the World Council Commission on Mission and Evangelism. He's considered the grandfather figure of Orthodox missions and he told me that he got that vision as an STM student here at the BU School of Theology. Um, Robert Stephanopoulos, the leading Orthodox ecumenist who established dialogues with Anglicans, Catholics, Evangelicals, and Jews. <coughs> Elikia Kihali, the General Vicar Nianza at the African Orthodox Archbishopric of Kenya Church and an, a missionary in Albania. Gerald H. Anderson, my, uh, my mentor, leading mission scholar, mission to the, missionary to the Philippines, head of the Overseas Ministry Study Center, first president of the American Society of Missiology, the first president of the International Association of Mission Studies, and the leader of missions, mission scholarship in the second half of the 20th century. Milo Thornberry, missionary to Taiwan in 1965, who supported the indigenous rights and independence movement and smuggled out of Taiwan the man who later became the first democratically elected president as a result, he was blacklisted by the U.S. government and denied a passport for 19 years. John McCullough was a U.S. 2 missionary, now as executive director and CEO of Church World Service. <coughs> then we have two missionary bishops still serving. The Right Reverend Abraham Mar Palose is the Episcopal of the Diocese of Mumbai and Delhi of the Martoma Church. He did his doctoral work here in missiology and Christian education and is known as a missionary bishop and the Right Reverend Ian Douglas, who did his doctorate in missiology and planned the Lambeth Conferences, was a missionary to Haiti and professor of missions at Episcopal Divinity School before he was raised to the bishopric last year. Reverend Canon Dr. Titus Pressler, second generation BU graduate. He's, he was missionary to Zimbabwe, then president and dean of the Episcopal Seminary of Southwest, 
Dean and Pre Professor of Mission and World Christianity at General Seminary, and since May he has been Principal of Edwards College in Peshawar, Pakistan, arriving, arriving in Peshawar the same day that Osama bin Laden was, was killed. Nancy Collins, an elder in the UMC, spent 10 years as a deaconess home missionary at the Red Bird Mission in Beverly, Kentucky. Here we have a couple of re recent uh, evangelical leaders, Andy Crouch, who got a vision for mission here and for 10 years worked as a missionary at Harvard with InterVarsity and has written some leading work on evangelical reflection on Western culture as a missionary problem. And a current student, Ruth Padilla divorced, who is the Director of Christian Formation and Leader Development, Leadership Development for World Vision International. That means all of World Vision, and that's the biggest Christian relief and agency in the world. And uh, she is also the president of the Latin American Theological Fraternity, the, the whole network of Latin American Protestant theologians. Olu Menje did his STM here and then received a PhD in mission history from the University of Wales. He is the head of Rick's Institute in Liberia that gives free education to 600 K through 12 children and he was recently elected the youngest vice president in the history of the Baptist World Alliance. Sungduk Oak, who holds the only chair in Korean Christianity in the United States at UCLA and yes, with a THD. <laughs> Charles Wiggins, Bishop, Methodist Bishop of Tanzania. This is a case of a guy who walked in my mission class and smiled and said, I'm only here to meet a requirement. <laughs> and when he then went back home to Arkansas as a pastor, he had a vision for mission, and when he retired, he and his wife sold everything they had, bought one-way tickets to Tanzania, and were living off their social security. He has started nine churches, has personally baptized over 500 people, and supports 200 orphans on $200 a month, and he's a retiree who uses a cane. And finally, a couple of STH missionaries today that demonstrate that mission today is from everywhere to everywhere. Here we have Reverend and Mrs. Kemba Jungu, missionaries with the Board of Global Ministries. Uh, Kemba is the mission superintendent of the Cameroon Mission of the Board of, Global, of Board of Global Ministries. And here we have another current student, Kenna Leone Ketsabile, who's the mission unit director of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. This is like being the head of the General Board of Global Ministries in, in charge of, the, uh, of five or six countries of what's the largest interracial church in South Africa. That's a current THD student. So let me conclude. The STH mission tradition represents hope and creativity. It represents a willingness to risk everything for the sake of the good news. Our founders and graduates can say with Paul, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. With this celebration of the Collins Chair, we move into the next century of living witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world, near and far. And may God grant us the strength and ability to carry this noble legacy into the future. You know, Dana would be brilliant if she could just get enthusiastic. <laughs> Once again, on behalf of the School of Theology, on behalf of Boston University, we are so grateful that you were able to be here today to witness this moment of passing and of embracing not just our past, but embracing a bold future. Terry and Barbara, thank you. Thank you to your family. Thank you for the vision of your forebears. And thank you for your faithfulness with us in this time. Ray, thank you for just making that trip to Portland and saying, I'm not leaving until we have a deal. <laughs> and to all of you, 
Uh, I want you to be part of the future of Boston University. We will come to a time over this next year in which you're going to hear from my office and from the president of this university and from the dean actually next week, reminding you of what's happening here and that we are not spending our time looking backwards, but we are spending our time building a future of having a stake. And we now have a university and a president that believes deeply in our mission and ministry. And that's a significant moment. And so I implore you, I plead with you, because my job is to do the ask. <laughs> Be part of us and help us continue what you've witnessed and given witness to here today. Be part of building that future of Boston University, of embracing a vision of learning virtue and piety that retranslates itself into the 21st century and is reshaping the world. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for today. Well